Hello, Granthamasha listeners. Believe it or not, this is the very last episode of the eighth season of Granthamasha. Over the past three and a half years, my colleagues and I have put out nearly 150 episodes that run the gamut from expert analysis on the latest state assembly elections to India's evolving stance on Russia-Ukraine and the plight of women struggling to find their footing in a male-dominated workforce. Each week, our small but mighty team works hard to provide informative, nuanced, well-produced, yet easily accessible content on India to practitioners, policymakers, and the general public. Putting out a great show week after week is a labor of love, and maintaining the high quality standards we've set for ourselves requires your support. If you enjoy the work we do, please consider making a contribution to our Grand Thamasha Fund. Your support will help offset costs associated with audio equipment, editing and production, marketing and promotion, and the research that goes into each and every conversation we have. To support the work we do, visit carnegieendowment.org backslash donate and select Grant Thamasha from the drop-down menu. Whether you can support us or not, we look forward to kicking off our ninth season of Grant Thamasha content in January 2023, and we hope that all of you will come along for the ride. Unabashed. The most unpredictable. Becomes a headline. The most volatile. Outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grantham Asha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. We've come to the very end of season eight of our show, and what better way to sign off for the year than rounding up the latest news out of India with our podcast regular Sadhanand Dume of AEI and the Wall Street Journal and Tanvi Madan of the Brookings Institution. Tanvi Sadhanand, good to see you both. Good to be back. Good to be back as well. So on this week's show, we are going to discuss three topics. We'll start by reviewing the recent elections in Gujarat, Mantra Pradesh and Delhi, discuss what, if anything, they tell us about the political landscape heading into the 2024 general election. Next, we will discuss Rahul Gandhi's Bharat Jodo Yatra and the future of the Congress party. Is this yatra a mere marketing ploy to rehabilitate Rahul Gandhi, or does it actually represent something more significant? We'll debate that question. And last but not least, on December 1st, India assumed the presidency of the G20. We'll discuss what all the hype is about and what we know about what India actually wants to do with its new role. We will start, however, with the recent elections. Um, As most of our listeners probably know, the BJP notched a historic victory in Gujarat, narrowly lost the fight in Himachal Pradesh to the Congress. And in the Delhi local elections, the Amadmi party clinched an important victory, although it wasn't quite as large as some had predicted. So then let me start with you. Uh, what do you think is the kind of, you know, macro 30,000 foot takeaway from this set of elections? Um, I would say, Melon, that sort of if you, if you were to separate them into those, all, all three, I'd say the takeaway from Uh, Gujarat is that the BJP remains an incredibly formidable election fighting force. The Congress remains a party in decline. And to the extent that we're already beginning to read early tea leaves for 2024, this is a very good sign for the BJP, that they are able to not only maintain power in this important, wealthy, industrialized state, but also do it in great style, increasing their vote share, uh, essentially decimating the opposition. And so it's a huge victory. So there doesn't seem to be BJP fatigue, at least not in Gujarat. From Delhi, I think the lesson is that the, though the BJP is powerful and well-resourced, uh, a scrappy contender can beat them. And I think that's where the, where the Ahmadmi party has really built its stronghold from the start. And it shows that they are able to hold on to that vote and 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 by get by getting rid of the BJP uh, hold of the over the MCD, the Municipal Corporation of Delhi. And in Himachal, I'd say the lesson is that even though Congress is clearly in trouble and is declining, uh, it doesn't mean that it can't, in some places, under very specific conditions, in states that are essentially bipolar contests with a long history of booting out incumbent governments, Congress can remain uh, competitive, even in, an Hindi, in, in a Hindi-speaking state, where, we, as we know, we've, sort of, they've lost a lot of ground, uh, particularly over the last, last decade. So I'd say those are the three. BJP still in pole position, uh, Ahmadmi as a scrappy contender in some places, uh, Congress uh, down, but not fully out for the count. Uh, could I just ask a, a follow-up, Sadan? I mean, do you think the victory of the Congress in Montreal is kind of a blip uh, that, yes, in a in a local election where the issues perhaps are very local, where you have anti-incumbency, you can make some headway, 
uh, or does it tell us anything about the Congress's hopes of revival come 2024? So I think it's a blip, right? Look at the conditions that allow this to happen in Himachal. First of all, Himachal Pradesh has had, they've had alternating governments between Congress and BJP going back all the way to 1985. Incumbents almost are almost never re-elected in Himachal. Uh, secondly, on the, that election was really not nationalized. It was fought very much on, on local issues. Um, in fact, the BJP star campaigner didn't even visit the state. Of course, I mean Rahul Gandhi. And um, so it's sort of, you know, under, under, under those circumstances, they fought on very local issues, things like restoring an old pension scheme. Uh, they kept it focused on, 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 on state politics. And there was the anti-incumbency effect. Um, I'm not sure if any of this is going to be valid when it comes to a national election, which, you know, are definitely not, not, not localized, or whether this is necessarily true of other uh, more important Hindi-speaking states like Uttar Pradesh where, and Bihar, where the Congress has cratered. So I would not read uh, too much into Himachal Pradesh. Um, however, the converse is also true that if the Congress had managed to somehow lose even here, uh, then I think that the, the, the obituaries that people are writing for them would have been even starker. No, and I want to actually jump in virtually and grab your host's mic and ask you a question about the scrappy contender uh, that Sadanand mentioned, um, the Aam Aadmi Party. Um, Arvind Kejriwal's Aam Aadmi Party has earned the status of a quote-unquote national party with its performance in Gujarat, even though, as um, as folks know, uh, they didn't they underperformed at least from what they were saying they would uh, come true in terms of the results. Uh, now, this kind of national party designation is something the election commission um, it dictates, um, possibly somewhat idiosyncratic as a designation, but it probably does not nevertheless signify an opening in terms of opposition space. Uh, Milan, what challenges do you think uh, AAP uh, faces as it tries to move beyond its traditional bastion of Delhi and Punjab? I, I mean, I think, you know, you, you sort of, the answer is implicit, I think, in the question. I mean, I think AAP has still yet to prove itself in a major way beyond its traditional catchment area of Delhi and Punjab, right? I mean, those are really the two places going back to 2013, 2014, where they have managed some luck, right? I think they are still seen a bit as a curiosity <laughs> in many other parts of India. Um, I think they have also yet to demonstrate that they can build a local cadre, right? This is still a party that is largely driven by one man, Arvind Kejriwal, uh, and, and his persona and his charisma. Um, but unlike the BJP, which has combined the kind of Modi magic with, you know, a real election fighting machine that exists in between elections, not just during elections, I think the op has yet to prove that, right? So I think those are the challenges. I think on the upside, uh, one of the things that's really notable, and I would just refer our listeners to Nilanjan Sarkar's post-election analysis of, of Gujarat, is that the the, uh, the Ahmadmi Party actually made some headway in rural constituencies, both in South Gujarat as well as Saurashtra, right? And this is a party that's largely seen as a party that appeals to kind of urban, more educated, kind of middle class or, or kind of, you know, uh, elite folks, right? So I think that's that's very interesting. And the second is that, you know, it is no small feat to turn a traditional bipolar contest into a three-way competition, right? I mean, Gujarat has had that legacy of being a bipolar state for decades now, right? So the fact now that OP is a contender, uh, I think shows you that, you know, it has to be part of the national conversation and not just part of the national conversation as we head into 2024, but I think a, a, a leading uh uh, uh, you know, bullet point, right? If we're making our list of, of kind of what to look for in, 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 in 2024, um, you know, uh, thinking about Gujarat for a second, Sadan, and maybe, you know, I'd, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this. I mean, one of the things I was really struck by is how resonant the 2002 Gujarat riots were. I mean, they were kind of seamlessly incorporated in into the BJP's campaign. And, you know, this wasn't really a race that was particularly close, right? I mean, all parties kind of agreed that the, the, the BJP was going to win. It was just a, a question of how big the margin was going to be. Why do you think it 
is that the BJP felt that they had to go back to this well of 2002 to, to win votes in what was kind of a walkover. I think you're referring to the speech by uh, Amit Shah, where he was reported of saying that we you know, taught rioters a lesson and there have been no more riots. And then the Himanta Biswa Sarma also said something about how Hindus never riot. And, and uh, you know, my, my, I think that this is sort of, I have a, I, I question the premise of your question because you're assuming, I think the assumption there is that under normal circumstances, the BJP has no need to resort to speaking about 2002, and that's a well they need to go to only when their back is against the wall. Um, but there's another way of looking at this, which is that for them and for many of their voters, uh, 2002 is not something to be ashamed of, and that 2002 was a watershed in Gujarati history because it broke the silence of violence uh, essentially by cowing uh, the Muslim minority. Uh, they don't necessarily see this as something uh, terribly shameful, right? Like immediately after the 2002 riots, in fact, uh, Modi famously campaigned on this as sort of about, this was about Gujarati pride. He was sort of, and, and that, you know, that may make us uncomfortable, but clearly that message has resonated. Uh, in the case of Himanta Biswa Sarma, I think there's probably more going on. I think it also tells you some a little bit about how uh, ambitious regional leaders, particularly people from outside of the BJP family. I mean, he came in, he was a longtime Congress person whose entire politics was the normal Congress style politics that you kind of get everybody to vote for you. I think in his case, he's sort of trying to uh, prove that he uh, belongs in the Sangh Parivar and the BJP. And so he has to sort of say some of these strident things so, so some of that some of that going on uh, also but uh, by and large I don't sort of I I was not uh, particularly um, shocked by 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 either of those statements you know Tanvi may, maybe this is a nice way of, of segueing to to topic number two which is about this uh, Rahul Gandhi author and the future of Congress you know you and I had the benefit of seeing each other very recently in Delhi and and, and this is of course what a lot of Delhi parlor talk is is about these days and uh, I found it very interesting that J. Ram Ramesh, who you know has the ear still of, of Rahul Gandhi, appears former union minister, uh, has said very clearly that look, this yatra isn't about elections; it's not about power, right? It's about the, the people, right? Uh, paraphrasing comments that he made to the media, and, and you pointed out, uh, and I think you've done this before, that the yatra didn't touch uh, Gujarat or Himachal Pradesh, you know, two two places where elections were ongoing. Um, do you think this is a, a strategy worked in Himachal? Yeah. Do, do, do you think this is a mistake or is there something you think that we're missing? Well, I think, you know, um, Congress party workers in Himachal Pradesh, where they won, probably uh, don't think it's a mistake, right? They they probably think, look, um, we, we, we did pretty well without um, it touching uh, our state. But I think, you know, as, and I think Sadanan mentioned this earlier, but it also showed that they won not kind of talking about uh, the necessarily the issues that Rahul Gandhi is bringing up during this Bharat Joro Yatra. So he might be raising social consciousness, but the issues, as, as Sadaran said um, earlier, that um, the kind of party locally was running on were local issues. And that is what resonated. So, I, you know, I, I think it both uh, perhaps shows that it might not be a mistake that they didn't go, but it's not clear that it also made a different to the difference to the conversation if that is what Rahul Gandhi is saying that he'd like um, to change um, I think there's you know there the, the the question though even is um you know had um had he taken it uh, taken the yatra through Gujarat would it have even made a difference uh, given the scale of the uh, BJP's victory and so it comes down to something I think we've discussed before what is the purpose of this yatra? Now, clearly, it's not the BJP doesn't think it's entirely irrelevant because they do spend some time. Uh, I mean, they might dismiss, dismiss Delhi parlor talk as, you know, Khan market gang uh, related. But even the BJP does, or at least uh, it's people on social media and et cetera, do spend some time pushing back on it. Uh, maybe it is big. That is because, as Sadanan said, they find Rahul Gandhi to be a useful foil and they think this uh, represent, it's a good representation of that. 
Um, but at the end of the day, and it comes down to, you know, forget all these other things. Uh, in a democracy, uh, yes, it's about the people, but it is also about power. It has to be about both. And that you get through elections and you have to win them. Um, and so even J.P. Narayan, um, uh, his kind of view and opposition, etc., uh, it didn't come to fruition uh, till Indira Gandhi was defeated at the ballot box. Uh, and so I think the question has to be, to what end? Um, and it, you know, if that, if the answer is uh, that it is about um, you know, having a conversation, that's fine. But then, then you know, um, then the Congress party, you know, is it in the kind of um, space of, uh, of do, you know, running kind of a social movement uh, versus actually governance? So, you know, are you going to be a guru or are you uh, kind of going to govern? And if you want to govern, you have to win elections, uh, whether that's alone or with, uh, uh, with other partners uh, who, um, yes, might be joining this yatra at some points, um, but are also largely going about their own business. Can I just start by saying that the comparisons with JP are completely farcical? I mean, if you go back to the 1970s, JP had been in politics for more than 30 years. He had been, he'd participated in the 1942 Quit India movement. He had built whatever moral capital that he had over a very long period of time. And so there was a great deep respect for him. He was able to bring people together. Uh, he had moral stature. And then he sort of decided to bring down Indira Gandhi and, he, and, and, the, and, and, and the rest is history. Um, I think if the Congress is trying to turn Rahul Gandhi into a JP-like figure by making him not shave for a few weeks and walk up and walk around, I mean, I think that's, a, that's, that's extremely, extremely uh, foolish. I don't think that's remotely realistic. Um, he has a serious image problem, and if they're trying to sort of fix it by, you know, taking him to the people, I think that is a that is a good idea. But the parallels with JP, the sort of the idea that Rahul Gandhi is now going to be seen um, as this moral force who's somehow above politics, um, that strikes me as being extremely misguided. So, could I just ask you about like the de minimis expectation then from this is that this would be uh, a rehabilitation of Rahul Gandhi's image, right? If nothing else, it does nothing for the party, does nothing for issues. At the very least, it should do that. So, Dhananand, you've been a, a relentless critic of, of 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 the younger Gandhi. Do you think that it succeeded, even in that minimal objective? I mean, maybe at the margins, right? But I mean, the way I see it, and it's gonna, it's it's all the, and I'm, it's true that I've been saying saying the same thing for several years now. But what's going to change my mind is a different electoral performance, right? Coming back to Tanvi's point, you, in a democracy, either you know how to win elections or you don't. Um, does it show that the Congress still needs to put, knows how to put together graphics? Yes. Does it show that Rahul Gandhi coming into town can motivate the local Congress cadre? Yes. Uh, does it show that there are sections, not very large sections, but there are sections of the media that are um, willing to uh, consider the latest makeover, um, sure. But I think there's very good reason for us to to be to remain skeptical. And I sort of, you know, I step back and I I think of the Congress as really this is like the Mughal Empire in the last half of the 18th century. Uh, it is declining. It's just a question now of who are the ambitious regional satraps who are going to come up and carve up the pie. And we can see some of that happening in Gujarat with uh, the Aam Aadmi Party. And we've seen that it happen, it happen in so many other states. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it, the, the question to me seems to be how fast and how far will they decline and who's going to carve up uh, what was once a pretty sizable pie. Uh, I don't see any evidence from Bharat Jodo Yatra that fundamentally uh, Congress has uh, stopped, let alone reversed its decline. Hey, Grant Masha fans. If you're looking for the latest insight into U.S. foreign policy, my colleague Aaron David Miller hosts former secretaries of state, U.S. ambassadors, White House officials, and the leading journalists on his podcast, Carnegie Connects. Go check out Carnegie Connects wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. I mean, you know, just to play devil's advocate for a second, I mean, I think, you know, if you wanted to be very charitable to the Congress, you could say, like, look, even in a state like Gujarat, where by all accounts from people who spent 
weeks and months on the ground reporting on campaigns said that Congress hardly put in effort. I think Rahul Gandhi showed up, addressed two rallies. Uh, They were very short of funding. It was a listless campaign. It was a leaderless campaign. It was an issueless campaign. Despite all of those things and the emergence of a third party, it still got 25% of the vote, right? So in that sense... But they had 41 five years ago. So that's a catastrophe in my book to go from 41 to 25. But I guess what it tells you, you know, the flip side is that like there is a floor still of one in four voters, right, who are going to vote for you because they're in search of an alternative. So if you somehow manage to turn this train around, right, like it's not as if you don't have a reservoir, maybe a diminishing reservoir, but we've seen even in the last few general elections, right, like kind of 20 percent kind of vote floor, right? So um, you know, is that is some kind of consolation or cold comfort to the, the Congress party stalwart? So very quickly, right? This is the Shekhar Gupta theory, right? That there is, they have a floor and even in, on, you know, they have at least around 20, 20% of the national vote. But this whole floor theory is based on their performance in the last election. Let's just say they go from 20% to 15%. And then we'll say that, well, oh no, well, you know, they have a floor of 15%. Um, but the fact is that their, their vote share declined between 2009 and 2014. It declined again between 2014 and 2019. And so unless we see some signs of a turnaround, I think the fair assumption is that 20% is just, it's just a, it's a, it's a way station on the way down. It doesn't necessarily, at least to me, represent a floor. I think the question also is, you know, what's going to lead to that turnaround? And it can't be doing the same thing again and again. And I think this is where the question that, again, we've debated repeatedly is, um, can you do that uh, with a, a leader who, or at least even if not a leader, the face of the party? Um, uh, you know, you, you saw on Indian TV channels um, as they were showing even the MCD, the Municipal Cooperation of Delhi results, they were showing the parties with kind of, you know, Modi uh, atop BJP, Kejriwal adop Aap's name, and then Rahul Gandhi, not uh, the Malika Arjun Kharge, the Congress party president. They were showing Rahul Gandhi and uh, on top of the kind of Congress um, section. So the, the question really is, is if the public still thinks of him as leading the party, and frankly, other party workers do, uh, despite a different president, and the Indian public doesn't seem to have, uh, you know, bought that brand, so to speak, um, or is interested in that. Um, if you keep trying again and again to do the same thing, uh, are you going to really get a different result? Um, particularly if it's not combined with a really real organizational effort to revive the organization of the sort you've talked about before, Milan. Uh, you know, I, maybe we'll just end this by 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 saying something about you know the, the 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 other exit ramp that the Congress has missed, which was this presidential election, right? Where you could have at least satisfied some of your critics by having a kind of free and fair, you know, internal election for the presidency, and, and instead the family made it very clear that they had a favored candidate, right, and kind of put their thumb on the scales. Um, uh, for a candidate who Cargay, who probably would have won anyway, um, but then you even kind of snatched, you know, defeat from the jaws of victory there, right? By 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 kind of you know going after Shashi Thurur, who who you know to his to his credit, whatever you might think of him, um, ran a very principled, uh, positive campaign. He he didn't say an ill word about the family. He didn't say an ill word about his his competitor in the race, um, and you know uh, from all I can tell, has only further become further ostracized, you know, from the from the party for 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 his efforts, right? So I think, you know, even in that limited sense where you can say, look, we finally held an election, uh, there's an asterisk, right? There's a caveat because um, uh, you, you sort of, you know, undermined your own, uh, your, 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 your lead, as it were. Um, we can transition to the, to the third and final topic that we we're going to discuss today, which is the G20. Um, as again, most of our listeners will be aware because it was kind of hard to miss if you've been covering the Indian press. On December 1st, uh, India assumed the presidency of the G20. It did so in the Modi government's typical kind of all out, high voltage fashion. You know, we had full page ads in newspapers. We had an op ed by Modi himself. I think every single, at least every single English daily carried it. 
we had holograms on, you know, Humayun's tomb and other places of the kind of G20 logo. Uh, Thunvi, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, why do you think this presidency is so important to the government? I mean, I think, you know, if you were to say France were the G20 president or the United States, it would provoke like a yawn or maybe an eye roll, right? I mean, I don't think it would register very, very, very far. Uh, what is the broader significance of this particular role? I think the, the, the way to think about how it, uh, this government seems to be envisioning this next year is both kind of from a strategic perspective uh, and a political perspective. Um, and they, you know, they do, as we know, they do kind of, um, you know, even governance is sometimes done campaign style in terms of big policy initiatives, and they do run very kind of good election campaigns. So in some ways, they're approaching this uh, as a, a campaign. Um, and you see kind of, you know, hundreds of events that that'll be held, but just on the kind of, you know, strategic side, and I'd fit both kind of geopolitical, but also the economic dimensions to this. Um, and this was, if your your kind of listeners will recall, the G20 was a you know financial a group uh, of you know where finance ministers uh, used to discuss issues. It's now become kind of a bigger uh, a bigger arena. I think if you think about both geopolitically and economically, why uh, this government might see this as important, it's partly the moment we're in, uh, where you see kind of uh, an India that wants to, and as the Indian foreign minister has said, the prime minister uh, has endorsed that, that India aspires to be a leading power. Um, and so if you're thinking about kind of trying to establish that uh, you know, th that kind of image of, and, and, and substantively, not, not just kind of from an image perspective, um, for India to try to shape uh, the world around it, which does affect Indian interests. And we've seen this with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we've seen this with economic head headwinds globally. But these things affect India, and India wants to be able to shape these decisions. Uh, and so, uh, and the you know kind of the choices that it is um, facing will be affected uh, by these global trends. Um, given India's capabilities, it can't affect all of them, but it does want to play a role. And I think we've seen it essentially try to be, and I think I might have said this before, a bridge between North and South. So you hear the word global South a lot these days in India and elsewhere. Uh, and so the G20 gives India this opportunity to show itself as the bridge between North and South and between East and West, uh, with a little bit of a caveat that, uh, that that East and West is the kind of Cold War East and West uh, with, you know, Russia versus West rather than kind of the China angle. Um, and you saw India in this past G20 summit, even though it wasn't hosting um, from everything we've heard, uh, reports coming out of India, but also uh, U.S. officials acknowledging that India played a role in ensuring that there even was a summit kind of statement, and especially in negotiating the language around the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so you're seeing India, I think, actually trying to shape uh, kind of the, the relationships between various powers to the extent that it can, because not because of just some status reason, but also because you know, the continuation of the war affects India's interests, the fallout, uh, economic, etc., cetera, um, from that Russian invasion of Ukraine um, has, as we've seen, not just affected India's interests, but large swaths of the global south, if not the west, which is India's kind of key market and source of investments, etc. So I think that, you know, there are kind of these reasons for India, both substantively in an image perspective, strategically to, to, to make a big deal about this G20. But I think it is also political, right? So this comes in kind of what essentially will be the lead up to the run up to the 2024 election. And for the prime minister um, who has from his first uh, election, national election, 2014, um, some might recall of the four or five things that were on his uh, campaign website uh, that he would achieve for India, uh, that he was promising to India was respect on the world stage. Uh, and for him, this is an opportunity to, you know, um, show that each of these kind of 19 other world leaders are coming to India and showing India respect and showing him um, respect. And so, you know, expect a lot of photographs of 
him shaking hands with these leaders with a big backdrop of the G20 logo that just happens to have a big lotus that is, yes, India's national uh, national flower, but it is also the BJP symbol, as we know. Uh, so, you know, you, you do see that there's this political aspect to this. Nonetheless, it's going to be a difficult year uh, as much as kind of, you know, India is going to want to uh, take, make strategic and political hay out of this. I think uh, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war that continues, as well as India's own problems with uh, China, uh, and we've heard uh, just as we're recording this, uh, today, a reports coming out of continuing India-China clashes. I think it's just it is going to be a tough year for India grappling with those. And you know, how do you handle visits from Xi Jinping, which would be the first since 2019, um, and potentially Putin, uh, or does he stay away again? So you know, negotiating these things will take time. So it's going to be tricky, uh, but nonetheless, I think the uh, the government will be trying to use this for their own purposes. So then let me just kind of follow up on what Thunby said. I mean, I was struck, you know, being in Delhi uh, at the way in which this campaign is being used and tailored for domestic political consumption as much as it is for the benefit of the kind of external foreign policy uh, world. And I guess the question arises, you know, what resonance do you think this leadership of the G20 has for the common person, right, the Am Admi uh, on the street? I mean, how do you think it actually links up to what they might care about in the run up to, you know, a significant general election? I think it will have a lot of resonance. Um, and I think that this is sort of this is a method where, as in many things, uh, Modi is following an earlier playbook and he's just playing this game better. Right. I mean, those of us who you know grew up in India during the Cold War would remember when you know there were all you know there was only one state-owned channel to Russia, and it would show Indira Gandhi hobnobbing with Brezhnev or Yasser Arafat, and you know the message there was that there's only one leader in India who is a giant, and all these other people are pygmies. There is only one leader in India who strides proudly across the world stage. Um, everybody, every, every, everybody else is small and parochial. And I think uh, Modi is very, very good. He's claimed that for himself, and he's very, very good at ramming this through. I'll just share one quick anecdote. Uh, before the last Lok Sabha elections, I was in Uttar Pradesh, and this is a time where India had received a lot of bad press, right? The Economist called Modi Agent Orange. Um, Time had run a, a cover story by uh, Atish Tasir calling him India's divider in chief, and so that was he was really sort of the 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 dominant view, at least expressed by the by the Western media, was that this is that you know, not a, he, he hasn't been very good for India or for how India is perceived in the world. And I remember talking to a mango juice seller uh, just outside Varanasi, and I was sort of talking to him about you know why he liked Modi and he gave many reasons including the welfare schemes and stuff but one of the things that he said struck with me which is that Modi has made India proud Modi has made India shine and 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 I could see where he was coming from because as you know on on his phone he's sort of you know he's looking at these photographs and there's like oh here's Modi with Angela Merkel and here's Modi with Macron and and if you notice in all these photos, you know, it's sort of, I, I find it amusing, but in 99% of them, Modi's always talking and gesticulating and everybody else, and then, then the other person in the photograph is just listening to him. And uh, I, he does it well. And so I think this is exactly the message that's going to go through. It's going to be that India has emerged on the world stage thanks to the efforts of this powerful, charismatic leader who the whole world loves and respects. That will be the message, and that will be the message that many people take. Building on Sudan's point about, um, you know, kind of echoes of, of the past, I don't think uh, any other leader since Nehru has done this kind of making foreign, talking about to the public about foreign policy in the world. And, you know, even if it's in the context of talking about, you know, self-reliance or Atmanirbharta, but or talking about, you know, explaining um, various foreign policies and using it with domestic audiences or explaining it to domestic audiences, talking to them about it. Um, and But I do think another thing worth kind of mentioning along with a lot of the op-eds, one of the ways that this has been planned is another kind of feature of Modi foreign policy in some to some extent, again, something uh, that Nehru would do in the past, which is, and, and this to much a greater extent today, just because you logistically you can, which is taking foreign policy out of Delhi 
which I think is a welcome move. And so, not, you know, not doing all the meetings in Delhi, though the main summit will be, um, but, you know, having various states. So this is not just, and again, yes, it's for political purposes, but I think it is also uh, to kind of make everybody feel involved. Uh, and then, you know, getting down to initiatives uh, where it does feel like it touches people's lives, where, you know, talking to states about highlighting, you know, their arts and crafts, et cetera. So, you know, I don't know if these will go outside hotels and these meetings will all be held there, but at least they are being held outside Delhi. And I actually think, uh, as somebody who's from Delhi, uh, this is a welcome move. You know, I was, I was speaking with a group of diplomats uh, in in Delhi a week and a half ago, and 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 one of the diplomats was 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 about to head to Mumbai for one of these consultations, and 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 she said something very funny, which was, you know, one of the first things that her Indian counterparts had asked for is her T-shirt size. Because the session is going to begin with yoga before they get into the substance, and everyone is going to wear these specially designed G20 T-shirts, and uh, it sounds kind of quirky, but 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 I mean, it sort of has this resonance, right? Which is like people from these 19 other major economies are kind of playing on Indian turf, right, and sort of paying uh, homage to, to, to Indian traditions and doing the things that, you know, Indians are quite proud of. That's part of the kind of soft power, you know, arsenal. And, 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 and I think, you know, something as small as that, right, actually, uh, it, could, it could, could sort of resonate. Um, My one objection to that is, uh, given all the talk about Indian culture and heritage and moving away from colonial mindsets, I wish they'd given you know the men and women who who don these uh, yoga uh, these outfits for yoga that they didn't give them t-shirts but gave them kurtas and kurtis, <laughs> uh, which you know frankly would would look better on everybody as well. I, I think it's easier to do a downward facing dog in a t-shirt, <laughs> Tanvi. Uh, I don't think a lot of them are doing downward facing dog. <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, we, we could talk much more about the G20, but I would just refer our listeners to my recent conversation with uh, the political scientist Karthik Natyapan, where we talked a lot about the G20 agenda. Um, l- let me bring this conversation to an end by by just asking both of you to kind of reflect on the coming year. Uh, there's a lot going on. There's the G20. There's state assembly elections. Uh, there's, you know, l- let's not forget a, a per- precarious economic moment, um, not necessarily even because things are going so horribly wrong in India, but because the the, the global headwinds are are considerable. Um, uh, Sadan, and let me start with you. You know, as we head into this new year, what is the one kind of India-related event, milestone, development that you're going to be keeping your your eye on? You know, I'm curious about how um, efforts are foot in India to give India some kind of international media presence. Uh, you've seen Gautam Madani, the billionaire, mentioned this in an interview to the FT. You have these changes going on in India domestically, where TV channels changing ownership and so on. And I think that there's a there's a sense that when India would like to have its own equivalent of, say, Turkey's TRT or China's CGTN or Al Jazeera uh, or RT. And I think this is something that will come to pass sooner or later. And I'd be curious to say what see what happens over the next year and what kind of shape this takes. Tanvi, what about you? Do you, is there something that kind of you're going to be keeping in the back of your mind as we, as we turn the calendar to a new year? Well, and for me, it's kind of thinking about this window of opportunity that so many have written that India has uh, at the moment, Um, whether it's because of geopolitical trends, concerns about China, you know, seeing India as um, as kind of being that bridge between North, South, East and West uh, as a result of the kind of fallout of the Russia-Ukraine war, particularly India working with countries and food, uh, fuel security, etc., and then, you know, the kind of economic diversification and technological diversification various countries and companies are looking for and seeing India uh, as potentially uh, a place uh, for that diversification. So in some ways, you've seen kind of, a, you know, a, several folks, uh, very smart people, talk about a window of opportunity for India. And I think this will this kind of next year is going to uh, tell us a bit about whether or not India can grasp that opportunity. 
Uh, and that will determine, I think, you know, whether or not it can do the things it wants to be do uh, when it, you know, talks in these speeches about aspiring to be uh, a leading power. And this will require trade-offs. It'll require choices. It'll require India, um, you know, um, dealing with um, head, uh, headwinds that will come from uh, that very kind of external environment that it wants to try uh, and shape uh, and and use. And so I think to me, what I'm watching is, can India take advantage of this window of opportunity? Uh, or, you know, are things like political uh, priorities going to take uh, take precedence over some of the kind of economic, uh, you know, perhaps reforms or other things uh, 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 that need to, that potentially need to be done, including in the, you know, trade and investment space? Uh, do those just become tougher and does India kind of uh, miss this, uh, miss this window? You know, I think one of the things just to kind of link back to our earlier conversations that I'm going to be watching out for is is, you know, what will come of the Congress, right? I mean, uh, it's a perennial question in some ways, but I think there are these series of internecine squabbles that are going on in Rajasthan between the current chief minister, Ashok Gelot, and the aspirant chief minister, Sachin Pilot, who is seen as kind of one of the young Turks in the party in Karnataka, which many people would say is perhaps the Congress party's best chance of picking up you know, a significant state because the BJP uh, government has, has has not impressed very many. You have, again, another internecine squabble between the former chief minister, Siddharamaya, and, and, and this kind of party boss, uh, D.K. Shivkumar. And, you know, whether or not the party is going to find the wherewithal to actually project a unified front, or we're going to continue to see this terminal sort of decline, right? I think it's going to tell us a lot about what the opposition space looks like in, in 2024. You know, I I certainly get the distinct feeling talking to people from regional political parties that they are looking for ways of thinking beyond the Congress rather than thinking of the Congress as a, an essential part of some opposition strategy saying, you know, we don't need these guys. And in fact, by keeping them in the tent, we're only tainting or tarnishing our own uh, image uh, by by being associated with them. Uh, but of course, that starts to change if the Congress finds the dexterity and flexibility to start putting the pieces back together under a new president, right? I have my own doubts about whether it's going to be able to happen, but I do think it's a very interesting question. And we'll see, you know, uh, not just in these two states, but of course, this is a Congress problem in many states, um, uh, this proposition being tested in 2023. So that's, that's what I'm going to be... I still say late late nineteenth century Mughals. <laughs> Which is all one way. Uh Sadan and Dume of AEI and the Wall Street Journal, Tanvi Madan of the Brookings Institution. Guys, it is always good to see you. Um thank you for joining and happy holidays and happy new year. Same to you. Thanks, Miller, and happy uh, and healthy holidays to all your listeners too. Grant Thamasha is a co production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review to help others find the show. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Production assistance comes from Nithya Love. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production, brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast